In this lecture, we'll be discussing theories of escape and avoidance. So what do we think drives escape and avoidance behaviors? So escape and avoidance are the two classifications of negative reinforcement. And to refresh your memory, negative reinforcement involves the removal of an aversive stimulus following a response, which leads to an increase in the strength of that response. So you perform a behavior, and as a result of that behavior, Something aversive, something you don't like, is taken away from you or stopped. And because your behavior leads to the removal of this aversive stimulus, then that behavior is strengthened. It's more likely to happen again in the future. With escape behaviors, the performance of the behavior terminates the aversive stimulus. So the thing that you do not like is already started, you perform the behavior, and that behavior causes the thing you don't like to stop. So for example, you have a stomach ache take medication and it makes the stomach ache go away. That's an example of a behavior taking the medication that allows you to escape something that's aversive, stomach ache in this example. Avoidance behavior by contrast, with this, the performance of the behavior prevents the aversive stimulus from occurring. So you perform the behavior and the thing that you don't like never begins. So an example of this would be taking a medication before you become ill, or taking lactate before you eat something that's dairy, so you totally avoid the stomach ache. Typically, people first learn to escape, then you learn to avoid. So in the beginning, you have to experience the aversive stimulus, engage in the behavior. That behavior makes the thing that you do not like stop. And in the future, you engage in avoidance behavior, meaning you perform a behavior that never allows the aversive stimulus to, to occur. So maybe in the beginning, you have to get rained on, you're getting rained on, then you put up your umbrella, which allows you to escape the rain. In the future, when you see clouds, when you see rain approaching, you put up your umbrella so you never have to experience the aversive event of being rained on. So first you learn to escape, then you learn to avoid. So we can see examples of first learning to escape, then learning to avoid in the laboratory. So you take a Skinner box, so a, a clear plexiglass box, and you put a mouse in this box where on one side of the box there is an electrified, electrified floor. So this allows the mouse to be shocked. There's also a light on the wall. On the other side of a barrier, the floor is not electrified. So if you were to shine the light, and electrify the floor, the first time the mouse would have to experience being shocked and it would not jump over the barrier until it had experienced being shocked. So in this case, the shock acts as a discriminative stimulus that lets the mouse know that if it engages in the behavior or the response of crossing the barrier, the reinforcement will be the removal of the shock. So again, this is escape because it has to experience the aversive stimulus, performs the response of jumping over the barrier that leads to the removal or to the reinforcer of having the shock removed. Next, the mouse will learn to avoid. So in this case, the light illuminates. Before the mouse is even shocked, it jumps over the barrier onto the part of the floor that's not electrified. So the behavior allows them to avoid the shock. So in this case, the light serves as a discriminative stimulus. Let the mouse know that if he performs the response of jumping over the barrier, it will be reinforced by totally avoiding the shock. So first learns escape, then learns to avoid. So theorists are much more interested in the phenomena of avoidance more so than escape, because what drives escape is pretty clear. You're experiencing something that's aversive, you perform the behavior, and it makes the aversive thing stop. So it's very clear what's, what's motivating that behavior. You want what you're experiencing that you do not like to stop. But avoidance is a little bit more unclear, because with avoidance, you're not experiencing the thing that you do not like. And performing the behavior just allows you to continue to not experience the things that you don't like. So it's not making anything stop. Moving from a state of not experiencing something that's aversive to a state of not experiencing something that's aversive. Again, you're not making anything stop. So really what's, what's driving this behavior? Because from the outside, if you're performing a behavior, it doesn't change anything in your environment. So the first theory 
that we use to explain avoidance is the two process theory of avoidance. And it says that there are two processes, processes that are invo involved in learning and avoidance response. Again, there are two processes that are involved in learning and avoidance response. The first is a classical conditioning of a fear response to a CAS. So this first part looks just like all of those classical conditioning reactions that we talked about at the beginning of the semester. So taking the example of the mouse in the Skinner box again with the electrified floor, the light is a neutral stimulus. It's paired with the unconditioned stimulus of shock. The shock causes the unconditioned response of fear in the mouse. So eventually, the light becomes a conditioned stimulus that leads to the conditioned response of fear in the mouse. So now the mouse has learned to fear the light. The second part of this two process theory is an operant conditioning response. This is the negative reinforcement portion. So here, the light has become a discriminative stimulus that lets the mouse know that they jump over the barrier, they show their response of jumping over the barrier. This leads to the reinforcement of a reduction of fear. So again, they learn to fear the light. The light lets them know that if they show the response of jumping over the barrier, that the barrier, jumping over the barrier will lead to a reduction of fear. So negative reinforcement because jumping over the barrier removes their fear. So in this theory, what the animal is avoiding is the experience of fear. So performing the behavior of jumping over the barrier leads him from a state of experiencing fear to a state of not experiencing fear. What's being taken away and what the animal is trying to avoid is the fear. And, you know, I can definitely identify with this. I've talked several times about my fear of the elevators in the public affairs building because they're very unreliable. When I really think about it, what I'm trying to avoid is not the experience of the elevator stopping because I, in reality, know that that's very unlikely. What I am avoiding is the fear that I feel when I get in the elevator. I know that when I get in those elevators, I get nervous, I get uncomfortable, and that is very aversive to me. It's something I do not enjoy. I know that if I avoid riding the elevators, I never have to experience that fear. So in that example, this two process theory really does make sense because I am you know, avoiding riding in the elevator because I don't want to have that feeling of discomfort that riding in the elevator is for me. Now, there are a couple of problems with this two process theory of avoidance. First, avoidant, avoidance responses are extremely persistent. When you think about classical conditioning and we talk about how to extinguish a classically conditioned response, you have to be exposed to the CS without the US. And let me go back to this equation really quickly. So to extinguish a classically conditioned response, you have to be exposed to the CS without the US. Meaning, in this case, you'd have to be exposed to the light without the shock. Over time, it will cause the extinguishing of the classically conditioned response of fear. And so you would expect in these cases, once the mouse is exposed to the light, or to jump over the barrier to avoid the U.S. of the shock, that the fear should go away. But if eventually the fear goes away, what is causing the mouse to continue to jump over the barrier? Because this operant conditioning response of jumping over the barrier is persistent, even though the mouse has consistently been exposed to the light without the shock. So you would think that the fear response should extinguish and the mouse should stop jumping over the barrier because it no longer fears the light. In reality, the behavior continues. So why does this fear of the light not extinguish? So people explain this, or theorists explain this, through the anxiety conservation hypothesis. And this says that the avoidance response occurs so quickly that there is insufficient exposure to the CS or the conditioned fear to fully extinguish. And this sounds very much like the idea of incubation that we talked about when discussing classical conditioning. The idea that you have to be exposed to the CS long enough to know that the U.S. is not coming. I think the example we used then was fear of dogs. If you expose yourself to dogs for a brief period of time, dogs being the CS, but you don't stay around the dog long enough to see that the U.S. of being chased or being bitten or whatever the U.S. is, you don't stay around long enough to see that that's not going to occur, your fear of the dog never fully extinguishes. So that is one explanation for why even though 
the mouse is learning to see the light, avoid the shock, and perform the behavior of jumping over the barrier. The fear never fully extinguishes because they're not exposed to the light long enough to see that the shock is not going to follow. They believe that the light is going to be followed by the shock, and so the, the fear persists even though they're able to avoid the shock. Um, another thing that calls into, calls into question this two-process theory of avoidance is that after repeated avoidance trials, the animals appear to show no evidence of fear of the CN, but they continue to perform the avoidance response. So after the mouse learns to jump over the barrier and avoid the shock, they show no fear of the light. When you put the mouse near the light, they, they don't seem to be afraid of it. When the light comes on, they don't show fear of the light. So if fear really is driving the behavior of jumping over the barrier, you would expect the mouse to show some fear when exposed to the light, but they do not. So for this reason, or for these reasons, um, most people really do not feel that this two-process theory of avoidance offers a good explanation for what drives avoidance behavior. So the alternative explanation is the one-process theory of avoidance. And with this, the act of avoidance is negatively reinforced simply by the lower rate of aversive stimulation associated with it. So here, the mouse jumps over the barrier simply because it leads to a lower rate of shock. So it's not because jumping over the barrier decreases its fear, it's just that jumping over the barrier leads to less shock. So this is attractive that does not require the inference of internal states like fear. So when you think back to our description of behaviorism, it's very much concerned with observable behaviors. They try to avoid making inferences about things that go on inside of animals or inside of people that you can't see. So this explanation allows us to look only at the fact that when I see the mouse jump over the barrier, I see that it's avoiding being shocked. So I can look at you know, observable things in the environment as opposed to having to guess about what's going on inside of the mouse. So these are the two competing explanations for what drives avoidance behavior.